Um, so tonight is the, I think it's the 11th week of our Tuesday night uh, Truth to Happiness study. This is going to be the longest uh, Truth to Happiness Dhamma study we've ever done. <laughs> but we've, I mean, we, we, I have introduced and we've stayed with uh, some new suttas uh, that I think are uh, adding to our understanding. Um, tonight's the third, the third week on the three marks of existence, and it's on the Dukkha Sutta. I was surprised when I realized that uh, I haven't taught this yet because it is the, uh, it is kind of the point, and it's a very those that have read it. It's a very short sutta, but in the sutta, in this sutta is the the entire Dhamma. It it references the three marks of existence, and it references how to get out of it, how to get out of those fabricated views. Um, the Buddha describes dukkha, as you heard me say a couple hundred times, that uh, dukkha, uh, birth, is, birth is suffering, uh, sickness is suffering, aging is suff suffering, death is suffering, not getting what is desired is suffering, getting what is undesired is suffering, and then he would always close that by saying, in short, the five clinging aggregates are suffering. And we know that the five clinging aggregates is simply the term the Buddha uses to describe the personal experience of suffering or ignorance. And that's why the, the title, I think, what did I call this? The uh, personal experience, personal of experience of ignorance, rather than the personal experience of suffering, because suffering is a consequence of ignorance. So it really is experience, experiencing the lack of understanding of who we are in relation to the world we live in. And again, that's, that's the whole point of the, the Buddhist Dhamma, to bring us understanding of that, not to escape it, not to create some magical way of looking at the world, to simply understand what's going on. Um, and this is, to me, this is even more interesting is, is that this sutta, um, as important as something called the Dukkha Sutta would be in the Buddha's Dhamma, this isn't given by the Buddha, is it? It's given by Sariputta. And those of you will remember that uh, Sariputta um, had much of the same um, experiences as the Buddha did while he was seeking awakening. They were, they were traveling around northern India and, and southern Nepal. Uh, must, they must have been meeting some of the same teachers. In fact, we know they did. Uh, along with Moggallana, they finally came across the Buddha very early uh, in the Buddha's teaching career. Uh, and because of their background and because of their intention to understand, they very quickly developed the Dhamma. Uh, Moggallana um, got it almost instantly. It took Sariputta about a whole two weeks to finally get it. Um, and they, both of those would become um, central figures and important teachers throughout the 45 years of the Buddha's teaching career. And they all three of those, Moggallana, uh, Sariputta, and uh, our friend Siddhartha Ji, uh, all died around the same time. Uh, and so here, this is from Sariputta. Wasn't uh, Sariputta uh, Ananda's teacher? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Directly. Um, that's another. There's, there's, I'm going to need a lot of lifetimes and you people are going to have to keep coming here because it, even that story is interesting, but there's too much else to, to get to. So. <laughs> uh, the Dukkha Sutta. On one occasion, Venerable Sariputta was in Malacca. The wanderer Jamba, Jambukadika approached with a question. Wise friend. When speaking of stress or dukkha, which forms of stress are referred to? Friend Jambukadika, there are three forms of stress. The stress of pain, the stress of fabrications, and the stress of change. Those relate directly to the three marks of existence, don't they? The stress of pain in a general way is dukkha. The stress of fabrications is the stress of not understanding who we are. We create a fabricated view of ourselves in relation to the world. And that's what we should be disgusted with or repulsed from. And then the stress of change is obviously the stress of impermanence. Those are the three forms of stress in the world. They're embodied in birth, sickness, aging, and death, not getting what we want, getting what we don't want, five clinging aggregates. Excuse me for speaking so quickly, but these are the things that we're looking at. The stress of pain. It's stressful to have to be disappointed, to have unsatisfactory experiences, to have physical, emotional, and mental pain. Why does it take an awakened human being to the why does why is there a need for that to be pointed out? Well, because it needs to be pointed out in the context of what the Buddha taught, how to understand it. 
the stress of fabrications. Anytime we don't understand what's going on because of our own wrong or fabricated views, there's going to be stress. Makes sense, doesn't it? And, be, and when we attach ourselves to impermanent objects, events, and ideas, and they will always change, including our own ideas about ourselves, that causes stress and, and disappointment as well. Correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all that we have to deal with. The stress of pain, the stress of our own fabricated view, and the stress of change. And as we develop the Dhamma, we learn to let go of all of those experiences to be any different than it is, including the stress of fabrication. Because we can't, when we become repulsed or disgusted with fabrications, we're now moving away from clinging to them. We simply abandon them. And that's how it relates directly to, to, to these other teachings. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is, again, it's through the Dhamma that we address these issues and leave them behind. And so now Saraputta says, uh, Jambukadika says, wise teacher, is there a path, a practice for the full understanding of these forms of stress? Yes, there, are the path, there is a path, a practice for developing full understanding of these three forms of, of stress. The path is precisely the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Somebody else, Ron, finish it. This is completely on the spot. <laughs> uh, uh, right effort, uh, right mindfulness and right meditation. Yeah, did everybody have that? Mm -hmm. That's why I did it, just to, you know, just to see, make you think a little bit about it. He concludes this by saying, this friend, Jamba Kadika, is the path and I would add the only path, the practice for developing the full understanding of these three forms of stress. This path, is an, this path is an auspicious path, an auspicious practice for the full understanding and abandonment of reacting to these three forms of stress and the development of moment by moment refined mindfulness. It's the end of the sutra. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Let's have some cake. <laughs> that cake. You should have that one first. I, well, I, 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 I thought about it, but I think it fits here rather nicely. For one thing, we've had some kind of longer classes. Um, but right here, this is, it's in the middle of the course. This is the middle of what we're looking at. This is the middle way, is, is, is not being afraid of addressing what we normally don't want anything to do with, meaning we want to ignore it. And we want to um, create magical ways of looking at it, at this problem of, uh, of fabrications, rather than directly address it, how? Through an eightfold path. Again, this sutta is, an, a, is a complete teaching. Of course, most of us need the understanding of some of the other suttas in the context of dependent origination and Four Noble Truths. But this is it. We're dealing with these three forms of stress. And if we develop the eightfold path, we can recognize and abandon our own contributions to pain, to fabrications, and to reacting to change. And it's that simple. So, let's see how Lauren is doing tonight. Oh, Do we start at the back tonight? Okay, <laughs> Frank, how are you tonight? I'm good, how's everybody doing? That was simple. It's good to be here, and um, thank you for the teaching. Um, yeah, there's really nothing to add to that. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Eric, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, definitely good to be here. And uh, yeah, I mean, the more that I, uh, I put this into my life on a daily basis, it's a lot easier to see, like, uh, like what you were talking about tonight. Like with uh, the stress of change and um, like the stress of uh, fabrications, I still um, like that one. I guess because like I'm still in the process of uh, like getting it all. Like that one is still a little bit harder for me to see. Yeah. But um, like things are definitely getting like clear you know, a little bit at a time, yeah. which is good. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Yeah. Helps out a lot. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yeah, you're you're describing the development of 
the context you need to understand what this means. I would bet for the first at least couple of classes, this all sounded like nonsense, didn't it? And uh, yeah, so give yourself a lot of credit for keeping going and maybe your dad's whip occasionally. But uh, it, 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 and again, until we have the right context, and this, this little sutta really provides a lot of context, doesn't it? Uh, and fabrications are difficult to understand because it's, it's who we've made ourselves to be. We've made ourselves out of fabrications. And so it's so close that um, there's, a, there's almost a reverberation like in our own minds, like the Buddha talked about uh, in the Narada Sutta. We get caught up in this feedback loop and we can't see what's in the middle of it, which is stress and suffering because of those fabrications. But it just means that we're, a fabrication is a corrupted view or a misunderstood or misinformed view of who we are in relation to the world. And that'll become even more clear as we come, go along. So, glad you're here. Might as well keep going. Bonnie, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, so the, <clears throat> the way it breaks down into the three, the pain, the fabrication, and change, uh, a basket full of experiences in the past couple of weeks that have really, um, you know, that gives me examples of fact, direct practice of those things. And um, I, I really loved how each one of those aspects of the stress relates to the three marks of existence because it, it um, uh, just helps to define it yeah. in a way that um, so I just have to keep looking and keep applying the framework and um, I get there when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost there. there. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, it, it, it takes the uh, the abstract ideas of impermanence, not self, and dukkha, and, and puts it. This is a practical application of those. So, thank you, Liz. Good to see you. Good to see you. Really good to be here. Um, yeah, fabrications. Um, you know, it's so interesting when you catch yourself defending something or saying something that's. That's really a total fabrication. You just, I mean, if it wasn't so real, it might be funny, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. When we start seeing we things clearly, it's, it's absurd to hang yeah. on to these things. But yeah. and, and, you know, of course, we all notice it and everyone else first. <laughs> <laughs> but when you catch yourself in it, um, it's, um, you know, it's interesting. And um, the Dhamma and, and this group and the Sangha gives you the understanding that that's what it is. No reason to light your hair on fire or anything <laughs> over it, but just to calmly back out of it and, and realize it and, and look for that kind of language again so that, you know, you can um, kind of find a way out of that. Um, so it's good. It's a, it's such an incredible tool for um, the things that come at you in life and not yeah. having to take everything as seriously as um, you might have before. Yeah. So Beautifully good. said. Yeah. When we, when we find ourselves feeling the, any one of these three stresses, we know it's because we're stuck in a fabricated view of, whatever it is that's occurring. And there's, we have, we've learned so many um, effective skills and what to do then. Come back to the breath, remind yourself, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am. And, and take a moment to break the, um, the clinging that would keep one thought feeding the next thought to the next thought, which is simply by recognizing this is a fabricated view, simply simply not true. Let it go. Thank you. Helen, good to see you. Thank you. Thank I hope you weren't disgusted with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now you kept it clean. <laughs> um, I had, you know, a, a disappointing event yesterday and 
um, one of my coworkers asked me how I was doing and I just said neutral. You know, that's where I was. I was just a neutral. I said mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go there. I wasn't going to stay there. I was, I was just in neutral. I just um, so, and I get. I think that's you know from this practice is yeah. to just be non-reactive to it in a way. Just if that's the way it is, it's disappointing. Um, people can be disappointing. Yeah. And um, you know, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, it is it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, other people are part of dukkha usually, and if we understand why, then we can stop wanting them to be different, mm -hmm. including our leaders. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, really, I'm, I'm I'm serious, and I'm not talking about just one person. I'm talking about the kind of the whole system now today. You know, it's all. The problem seems to be these deep held fabrications from everyone and they're insisting that they're true and they're just look kind of everybody's looking foolish by insisting that they are. David, good to see you. First, imagine first defilement is ignorance. Yeah. And it's the origins of all other defilements, whether it be... Yep jealousy or anger or any other fabrication by claiming aggregates. Okay. So, so practices to replace ignorance with the wisdom. And it seems like the Sarapuna, it's such a simple lesson. And it seems like it then expands out to the need to explain it in different ways. Yeah. Expanding it when the Buddha started with Four Noble Truths, and then it expanded, you needed to go beyond that and have you know, bigger and bigger explanations. Yeah, and depending on the situation. Depending and, on the situation, yeah. and having different words when discussing it needed to be used in one situation. And I'm sure it was a struggle. To, with different crowds, different people, different levels of understanding. Yep. And I think that's where a lot of that comes from. But it really does come down to uh, understanding suffering. And it it all does. To you know, cessation of it. So that's why when you say, do you see uh, different things? Well, that's what it is. You're seeing different things because you're hearing it differently but it's really in essence the same thing yeah so. yeah it is. and and you're you're absolutely right that it it all comes down to ignorance that's how the buddha what the buddha awakened to ignorance is the problem and it causes stress and suffering and so he taught a way of seeing things in reality or noble truths and though and the the expanded suttas were all situational you know and some of them had to do with uh, the Buddha didn't, uh, he wasn't separated from the world at all. In fact, the, the original Sangha was deeply involved in the world. You know, we like to think that they went away and they, you know, they lived in the, in the forest and, but every day they were out in the world and most of the awakening monks and nuns went out and, and spread the Dhamma. That was what they did. It must have been early because he was asking, is there a path? Yeah. Yeah, and and again, this whole, this whole sutta points to the entire the entire dhamma is included in it, and yet for most people it wouldn't be enough, would it? You know, to just say this, you need you need Tell the other way. Yeah, and you need and you think about the, he's pointing Jambakadika to the eightfold path, and then you know we don't know, I'm speculating too that Jambakadika comes back and says, okay, um, I'm in the right meditation part of it. What do you mean by that? And then he could teach him about jhana. And, and break it down that way. But this is the framework. Again, we, we have developed, Eric is a good example of, of developing the framework we all are of the Eightfold Path as a way of developing awakening, developing understanding. It's just that way. Just like Saraputta told Jamba Kadika, it's through the Eightfold Path. Thank you. Ron, good to see you. <laughs> you again. <clears throat> I was surprised when I read the, the your email the first time 
um, that I didn't pick up right away on, on the on the three um, on the three marches of existence being in there. It took me a couple of readings. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I've got it. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Comes back to ignorance. Yeah, and these again the the abstract application of just the words that don't really have much meaning here's the experience of it right here it's painful it's fabricated and it's always changing three marks of existence how do you understand it a full path thank you kevin good to see you good to see you john really appreciate this this teaching especially at this point you know not that most of us have read the book before and just the clarity that it provides in sort of the moment to moment process that we, that we are involved with here. And, and I just sort of, you know, what, what the Buddha described with, with the stress is it's sort of the, the stress of releasing wrong views, acknowledging right view and, and understanding mm -hmm or embodying awakened right view. Yeah. That's sort of the process that he described there with the three types of stress. Yeah, it, and it, it's just that, it's interesting how the timing worked out for me. I'm, I'm going, I don't know how many of you are watching my, or listening to my Thursday night talks, but I'm going through a series of talks on each chapter of the Dhammapada. And tomorrow is chapter 16, which is called the Sukha Vaga. Sukha means um, contentment. So we're, today we're talking about dukkha, the problem of stress and suffering, and the Sukha Vaga talks about what it feels like to awaken. It's simply a contented way of living in the world that's lasting. And it's based on understanding. It's not based on acquisition at all. So, and that's why it lasts, because we own it. You know? We own our understanding. It's really the only thing we can own, isn't it? We can't own this body. We can't really own our minds, but we can train them but we can own our understanding. It's ours. In fact, it really is. Again, I'll say it again. It's really the only thing that we can truly own. Lorna, are you ready now? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really uh, ready, but um, it's, it's um, very quick, very direct and kind of amazing that you can boil all, all your stresses down to those three elements, you know, Either one of them or all of them. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. And so that causes so much suffering. It's terrible. Um, and then in my own practice, I've been trying to work out uh, impermanence and looking towards the next moment and seeing and seeing the the next moment as is a fresh moment in an awakened yeah. moment until I bring all the baggage, the yoke with it. Yeah. It, it, it really is as close as that. If I could just understand, or not understand, but if I, if I just dare go there, you know, that you just don't have to carry all that baggage with it into the next moment. The yeah. next moment is there, free of any referential thoughts, and and it's there all the time. Wow. That that's it, and that you're when you can do that, you're not fabricating what your experience now is, yeah. and so you're you're living life in this moment. As soon as you as soon as you apply. A condition or fabricated view to anything and it's occurring you're you've lost it you're not in your body anymore and you're not in this you're not in the situation you're seeing it completely in a in a completely um irrelevant way in what's occurring instead of being mindfully present and when we're mindfully present we're at peace so thank you let me see what the see what jane has to say how are you jane i'm fine how are you john i'm good thank you for asking um, all what do you I, know, think that I was going to say, prior to my Dhamma practice, I was all stressed all the time. And all I know is I don't want to go back there. 
<laughs> Me either. <laughs> well, the good news is that if we keep doing what we're doing, we don't have to go back there. Right. Uh, I'm glad you joined tonight. Thank you. Um, but I'm, unfortunately, Jane, you can't uh, try any of Frank's um, pound cake that's out here. Um, what? Unless you get here within 10 or 15 minutes. But, what? Uh, oh. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, let's not forget. And Helen, the container is yours too, if you want to take it with you. It won't be washed, but oh. you can take back your container. Thank you. Uh, or we some other I, I, was, I, was, I wasn't going to say that, but that's kind of what I was hoping. <laughs> uh, I, think that, I think it's nice to have an early class, I guess, you know, or should I talk for another hour? <laughs> that was, you, it would have been okay if you said no please no <laughs> uh our retreat's coming up please come <laughs> we'll uh we'll finish with meta as we always do all right next week we're going to get into the not self characteristic and dependent origination we'll probably break that down over at least dependent origination over uh two classes just because it's a long sutta and then for the five clinging aggregate portion i will be introducing i'll be using another sutta but one that we've talked about before uh and then i've talked called the anurata sutta but that's not the one that's in the book so. okay so find your relaxed meditation posture gently close your eyes gently close your mouth and again take a moment to become mindful of your in breath and your out breath These are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, content and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class. See you, Jane. Good night, John. Have a good week. You too. Good night, folks. Good night. You're not going to have.